Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar, Healthcare Reform Trends Again Across Europe. What have been the key issues? Why should we research reform trends? I think it's very important because if countries are reforming their health systems and they have similar problems, we can learn a lot from defining what is actually the issue which we need to tackle. We can understand the reforms, we can understand the issues in different contexts and learn from it how they interact. And of course, different countries may opt for different policy options. So we widen our arsenal of tools for fixing health system. And then last but not least, implementation. How do countries actually do this? What sort of instruments are they using for implementation? What sort of things do they really need to change? So monitoring reform trends and analyzing, there's a lot of learning for policy making in it. And I think it is now more important than ever because everybody is talking about build back better now that COVID-19 is slowly um, phasing, phasing out, hopefully. And of course, we all want to have much more resilient health systems because we've seen during COVID-19 that uh, a couple of issues in our health systems were not very strongly performing. And of course, there is an unfinished reform agenda from before COVID-19. And I think that we really need to resume the work which has not quite done yet. And there are plenty of themes ranging from financing. How do we make the financing more sustainable? How do we make it more equitable? Primary care, almost all countries are trying to strengthen or improve their primary care system and choose new models of healthcare delivery. Organizations of hospital care, of course, vis-a-vis -vis the developments in primary care, but also because of new technologies, innovations, and new ways of working. And of course, digital health, one of the issues which is bothering so many countries in Europe. And last but not least, governance. How can we reform governance, improve it as a lever for better policy making and implementation? And reforming, monitoring healthcare reform trends is one of the key tasks of the um, observatory. And uh, to this end, we have actually a vast network of expert, the health systems and policy monitoring network with close to 40 member institutions from across Europe and selected OECD countries. And they are helping us to monitor um, health system developments across these countries. And we have uh, as an output, the healthcare in transition profiles for all the countries in the WHO European region plus selected OECD countries. We help the health systems and policy monitor online. You can search and compare. We have the COVID-19 health system response monitor. And last but not least, together with the OECD, we also develop country reports for the European Commission. Today, I'm very happy to announce that we have a great keynote speaker. It's my colleague, Kate Polin from Technical University Berlin. We've been working a lot together with Technical University Berlin and with Kate, and I can't wait to hear her keynote. We have also distinguished spotlight speakers, Ilmo Keskimaki from the Finnish Institute for Health and Welfare, and Lucy Brindova, Charles University Prague, Czechia. I think that makes a quite nice country spread but I think that also Kate gives us a very good overview of countries across uh, Europe. Just a couple of things for the housekeeping. Please use the chat to convey your messages, comments, and questions. And my colleague, Anna Mariso, she will bring them together. And at the end of the session, she will feed them to the panelists and the panelists will respond to them. We are recording the session and the session will be put online on our YouTube channel in due course. And last but not least, please watch out for the next webinar and tune in next week at the same time. We will deal with COVID-19 and mental health, common challenges and policy response. So that's it from my side. And uh, now, um, Anna, would you be so kind and present uh, the poll? Yes, hello, Matthias. And hello, everyone. Um, as Matthias said, we look forward to receiving your questions during the discussion part of the uh, webinar. So please do put in your questions.
questions in the chat. Um, but before we start uh, with the presentations, we'd like to put up a poll and you can see it here now. Um, it's just to get a reading of the terrain, so to speak, from the perspective of our audience members. So for today, oh, we have an untitled poll <laughs> with some questions there already. Let's just, um, while um, Lucy is uh, fixing the poll, it seems to have some pre uh, loaded uh, answers, but the, um, when we get it fixed, the question was, have there been ongoing health systems reforms in your country throughout the COVID pandemic? And the idea was for you to answer, um, have, there, have some reforms already been progressed, whether or not they're connected uh, to the COVID response? And, um, the, and if so, we we had some uh, categories um, listed there, but perhaps this can be a, a stimulus for some of the questions that you'll be asking uh, in, the, uh, in the chat. We see already some questions. We, um, so I think we'll leave it on for another 30 seconds uh, as people are answering. And then back to you, Matthias. Thank you so much, Anna. I'm quite curious to see what the perception of the uh, audience is, you know, what has happened in their countries and where the focus is, because our keynote, Kate, uh, will now tell us a little bit what is the focus, what are the top um, health care reforms in Europe and selected OECD countries. And that is now the moment, Kate, that I would like to ask you to come on board and switch on your camera and um, deliver your keynote. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you, Matthias, for the friendly uh, welcome. I want to uh, say good afternoon. Um, thanks for being here for this review of trends in healthcare reforms in Europe. Plus, as Matthias just mentioned, select OECD countries. So that is namely the UK, Canada, the US, and Israel um, since 2018. This I will talk about for the next 15 minutes or so. Um, as this is a tall task, <clears throat> and there's a lot of activity out there, I wanted to narrow the conversation of the next quarter of an hour a little bit and talk you through what, what is to come in the next slides. So first I will present a definition of healthcare reform or healthcare policy reform that we have been using um, at the TEU and at the observatory. Um, and then I want to present some main findings from a paper in health policy that was published earlier this year, looking at the health reforms from 2018 and 2019 with the help of the HSPM network, which Matthias also mentioned. Um, and then we want to look at Come some preliminary findings since 2018, 19, and then 2021. So some follow-on work from the paper itself, uh, and then kind of swing back to look at what these trends um, imply or might uh, suggest and what uh, the implications for building back better, as Matthias mentioned. Um, so uh, just a quick, um, information for you. Our definition of health policy reform is based on the OECD's definition of a policy reform. Um, and so we've just amended it a little bit, but uh, the, according to the OECD, a policy reform is a process in which changes are made to the formal rules of the game, including laws, regulations, and institutions to address a problem or achieve a goal such as economic growth, environmental protection, or poverty alleviation. In return, we've adjusted that to the health sector and we are the health system um, and we look at a health system or policy reform as a purposeful process that involves systematic policy structural or process changes and is aimed at achieving desired goals. Um, so that is just um, for the for your background information. Uh, as mentioned, the first part of my observations will be based on this article, Top Three Health Reforms in 31 High-Income Countries in 2018-2019. Um, it, uh, it looks not only at the content, but also the implementation status of reform, reforms reford, reported, excuse me, in 2018, in 2019. Um, and just to note that all of these reforms were informed by expert um, interviews and experts coming from the HSPM network. 
So it is um, actually the product of an exercise which was started in 2018 during the annual meeting of this network in which country representatives were asked for the top three reforms in their perspective of their countries. Data was collected therefore across the next, uh, from, since 2018 in a survey um, and each reform was assigned a cluster um, out of 11. Uh, this cluster list is an evolved list that's based on um, an initial list from the actually template that Matthias mentioned, the health systems and review template that looks at um, health systems in about eight dimensions. Um, I would just uh, encourage you all to look at those reports. They're very interesting and provide a lot of con country context. Um, we also, just as a side note, looked assigned a political level to the reforms. Um, so we were looking at, you know, be it a central government legislative reform or a change to a constitution? Was it an explicit strategy from the government? Um, was it led by a health agency? So uh, the Ministry of Health or an insurance entity or a, um, you know, in Germany, whether it, uh, the federal committee, um, so sort of a semi-autonomous health in, um, agency or what? And we were, I won't get into this in this, um, next 10 minutes, but we were also very interested to see if there was a association or could be an association between the type of the type of type of reform or political level and its implementation success. So um, just uh, in terms of the reform clusters, these were the 11. Um, we have noticed that these 11 clusters from governance to pharmaceuticals may not be fit for purpose across years. So it's a, a taxonomy that we're continuing to um, evolve in an iterative process. But the survey response, at least for um, 2018 to 2020 was quite good. We see that uh, 30 countries of the 31 report um, asked report in 2018, um, 28 had actually reforms to report. And so we have uh, quite a few reforms that we're trying to condense into um, and glean lessons and patterns from, as you see. So a total of 81 reforms in 2018 that we're looking at, in, 20, in 87 in 2019, um, and in 92 in 2020, and actually 66 for 2021. So, um, uh, we, I will try not to get lost in the detail, but you can imagine how much detail there actually is. So um, moving into the results, in fact, of um, 2018, what we saw was that of the 30 countries um, that reported back, um, we had four main reform areas, and these were coverage and resource generation, uh, governance reforms, purchasing and payment reforms, and organization of hospital care. Um, in uh, and then there were sort of secondary, not secondary, but we call them the le also quite active, but not quite as active. And I'm distinguishing for the purposes of this um, presentation, tier one and tier two reforms, um, but we see that public health was also an activity of pretty frequent reform for the 2018 reforms. And um, so it was primary and ambulatory care and digital health. Um, and then in 2019, there was a bit of a shift. So we had um, of the 86 reforms that were reported in 2019, excuse me, more than half, about 56% fell into the, these top tier reform areas of primary and ambulatory care governance. Then there's a new one that you see here, care coordination and specialized care, um, organization of hospital care, and then again, digital health and human resources comes up here. The results of the, these two individual years does show a considerable reform activity and overlap among countries. Um, and so what we looked at was the three reform areas with the greatest number of reforms across both years. And that um, was governance, organization of primary and ambulatory care, organization of hospital care and digital health. Um, looking at these sec, uh, reform areas in detail, there were several cross-cutting er issues. Um, so if we look at, um, 
digital health, uh, excuse me, this is for organization of hospital care. Um, several countries targeted restructuring their hospital networks and strengthening hospital planning um, and centralizing highly specialized and emergency care, for example, in Finland um, and Norway and Sweden. And then also um, on the flip side of that, or sort of redefining the role of the smaller hospitals. Uh, and then um, in governance, we saw of various attempts at tackling this um, centralization and decentralization of the health systems overall. Um, so in terms of centralization, for example, Canada um, or an, one region in Canada, Saskatchewan, um, was attempting to re-centralize its regional health system. Um, in Lithuania, for example, governance of providers was centralized, giving the Ministry of Health more oversight authority for approving the provider network. Austria passed a reform to strengthen central level governance of the system by merging nine regional social health insurance funds. Uh, in Finland, and I think my colleague Ilma will be talking a bit more about this, um, a reform aimed at centralizing governance re responsibility for care delivery. Um, and then uh, in contrast, two countries actually focused on system decentralization. Uh, governance reforms that we saw actually aimed overall to support developments in primary and ambulatory care and hospital care. So there, so you do see that these clusters are not um, mutually exclusive clusters. There's a lot of overlap in terms of the intent of reforms, um, and uh, which does make this quite interesting. Um, in terms of organization of primary and ambulatory care, some cross-cutting themes included pay for performance um, and chronic care as a focus, so improving chronic care coordination at the primary and ambulatory care level. Um, also an expansion of the scope of care and we were seeing um, attempts to uh, make the primary care delivery more multi-professional. Um, and then we see for digital health some cross cutting themes of access and care coordination. And I'm just pointing these out because they will pop up uh, a little bit later as well. Um, just a side note, in fact, um, in 2018, as you can see, coverage and resource generation was a main focus reform area. And when looking at the details of these, we can see that changes, including expansion to population coverage or um, service coverage uh, was included in this. And um, in care coordination and specialized care in 2019, mental health started to emerge as an important um, focus area. Uh, in terms of implementation, just very, very quickly, um, we see that most reforms in 2018 were ongoing in 2019, um, and that most reforms that were implemented were in digital health and public health. Uh, no reforms from human resources or governance um, were uh, implemented. And um, also there seems to be some sort of an association between type of reform and the chances of implementation. Reforms under the jurisdiction of health agencies from 2018 um, or insurance entities were, uh, had the highest rate of implementation, for example. And then when looking at 2018 reforms in 2020, we saw that a few more were implemented, especially in digital health and uh, in primary and ambulatory care, but far more had been put on hold due to COVID-19 and a few had actually been abandoned. It's also increasingly hard to track implementation um, of reforms, um, as you can see from this, the missing value. <laughs> uh, the, so I think, um, again, in 2019, the reforms um, when looked at in 2020 and 21 were mostly ongoing in part due to COVID. So what Matias says about the um, unfinished business is absolutely a, um, a main finding. So, and in 2020, unsurprisingly, the reform activity 
across um, the main clusters, as we've seen, um, really focused on emergency measures due to COVID-19 and even some more uh, COVID-19 inspired structural changes to the systems. Um, but beyond that, there were also some um, other cross-cutting issues, for example, mental health and care coordination and specialized care. Interestingly, you will see that a lot of the cross-cutting issues from 2018 to 2021 are, um, are quite similar. Um, so perhaps health systems had had the right idea um, and an inkling of the weaknesses um, before COVID-19 came along. But in any event, another uh, cross-cutting issue for um, insurance coverage and care coordination, in fact, is community care um, and different ways of covering that or strengthening community care or care in place. Um, and then you have for digital health and transparency, this idea of access and how to use digital health solutions um, to address access issues or even inequities in the system. Um, and then two others are integration and care coordination. We actually renamed a cluster in 2020 because of this overwhelming, um, because of this uh, salient cross-cutting issue of care coordination to be care coordination and specialized care. It had originally been called chronic care. And then there's um, a lot of very, the more emergency measures due to COVID, we're looking at scale mix, so at, in the, at the hospital level um, and then in human resources as well. Um, and then for this year, we um, are seeing similar trends. Um, so of the top three reform areas, tier one, we have governance, insurance coverage and resource generation, care coordination and specialized care. Within care coordination and specialized care, mental health uh, it came up again and again. Um, and we are therefore considering making it actually its own uh, cluster in the future. Um, which I think from historical or since 2018, we have a good case for. And then um, care in place again for care coordination came up again um, and a new idea of social prescribing. So, um, you know, non-medical uh, ways to treat um, mental health or health issues in non-medical or non-clinical ways. Um, and then just for sort of a, an example um, of governance, so sorry, uh, then there's an increase of expansion of breadth, depth, and scope of coverage um, and insurance coverage and resource generation, importantly, was in tier one for um, reform area for 2021. Um, we, as an example of that would be that Spain introduced um, a new co-payment exemptions um, for certain services, while in the UK they introduced a health um, and care levy, so not just health but social care as well, including additional funding. Um, and then in the US, for example, there was a, the ACA expansion of subsidies. Um, and then there was new subsidies to address inequities across the board. And we see for governance um, that rather than there be this dynamic between centralization and decentralization, that there was in fact more focus on centralization. Matthias, I see you, I think I've run out of time, but I have two more slides, is that is that okay? Yeah, one more, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, and so digital health. Uh, so this is just a quick overview of the reforms. We see that there is a huge amount of overlap between 2018 and 2021 in terms of reform areas. Um, and in terms of considerations for health systems um, and the future, what we've seen is that yes, the reform agendas from pre-COVID, uh, the implementation has slowed, also in part due to the nature of reforms anyway. Um, they can be multi-year and multi-faceted, but there's a lot of um, similarities in the main clusters, though I would say that there's a convergence of main reform areas and objectives 
um, over the last four years, um, and that we're looking at more systematic approaches to tackling issues uh, and challenges of the health system, as said. So there's more centralization um, within governance. And while hospital organization had been a primary area, this focus has somewhat slowed. Um, and um, so has focus on cost containment. We're looking more at major allocations to the health system at the moment. Um, and we, there are some reforms like digital health where it could be considered supporting clusters. They come up again and again and are also seem to be more easily implemented in certain countries. Um, and yes, similar cross-cutting themes, mental health, expansion of coverage. Um, and in some cases, uh, these cross-cutting themes, we will try to take on um, in our own taxonomy. Okay, I think that's it. Uh, it is a lot. I, I Thanks for bearing with me as I synthesize this information and I will um, turn it over to you, Matthias. Hey, thanks, thanks so much. That was an amazing overview and a lot of material. And uh, I thought, you know, when I, when I was sewing, seeing this, I thought we very often talk about Europe as a perfect laboratory for health care reforms. And uh, it's actually true, you know, in three consecutive years, you've covered 81, 87, 93 reforms. And I think there's probably a lot to learn from those for policymaking and how to, to, to make it right. And also the reforms you are reporting, many of them seem to be really very substantial. You were talking about provider centralization, pro centralization of sickness funds, you know, expansion of coverage. So these are really the, the big topics. Would be interesting to talk a little bit about the shift of the priorities. I felt when I saw your overview, governance was always very important. And there was one thing we discussed in an earlier um, webinar, that governance is really one of the key levers, you know, to make health systems reforms possible actually. And I thought that uh, initially public health not being really a priority, maybe we have paid for this in the COVID-19 and countries are now reconsidering for better resilience to strengthen uh, public health. Also very good that there's follow up, you know, that you see things that are really implemented, quickly implemented, pending or failed, and also to um, link them a little bit to the, to the um, um, instruments for implementation. Well, thank you so much, Kate. And I can't wait for the spotlight speakers to zoom in on the particular countries, you know, to, to go into some uh, more details. But before we do this, um, Anna, is the, has the poll worked? You know, do we have results from the poll or was there a technical glitch with the poll? <laughs> No, I think it worked. Perfect. Uh, but, uh, on my screen, it was looking uh, a bit glitchy, but I think for everyone it worked. And I'm happy to say that I hope you can all see it, um, that the results are that, um, yes, um, more than 88%, um, it says there, that there have been ongoing reforms in countries during the pandemic. And if we scroll down, it's very interesting that um, digital health um, there's been uh, two thirds of our respondents said that there've been major um, reforms in that area. And in the other areas have also seen equal um, amounts of reforms, um, specifically, you know, financing, primary care. So all of these areas, even governance, uh, your pet um, topic there, Matthias. So there's been a healthy amount of reform activity despite the shock of the COVID pandemic. Over to you. Thank you so much, Anna. And I would actually suspect that uh, reforms in the area of digital health have been accelerated uh, due to the COVID-19 from ranging from apps to telemedicine and to, to many other things. Thank you so much, Anna, for giving us the results from the poll. And now it's time to zoom into country experience. And we start with Finland and um, Ilmo. Please switch on your audio and your video and fill us in on the finish health systems reforms, please. So um, in a way, uh, the Finnish uh, health and social service reform is not uh, linked to the, to the COVID because it's been making already for uh, something like 50 years. Uh, the, uh, the focuses of the different gov government, uh, government has changed a bit, but let's say last uh, six years, uh, we have had an idea of, uh, of, of, of the reform, what has been finally pushed through the parliament uh, in, in last summer. So this is a, a 
uh, in, in, in a Finnish perspective, a huge uh, administrative reform of, of health and social, social care sector. So when at the moment the Finnish health and social care sector is municipality based, over 300 municipalities are organizing the, 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 the health and so, uh, social services are, are uh, uh, responsible for funding funding of the services, of course, with the support from the from the government subsidies, and is also responsible for for um, providing the services of the most of the services in in the, in the Finnish health and social social care sector. Now, in in a in a little bit over a year's time, we will have um, a, a reform system based on on. Uh, well, well-being services counties, which are responsible for organizing, providing uh, providing the services, as well as the the funding system is is uh, uh, profoundly changed so that uh, that most of the of the costs are covered direct directly by the central government. So uh, it is easy to. Um, to imagine that this 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 has been a difficult task because when the the healthcare system health and social care system has changed from uh, from the municipalities to the, the, the county level organizations that has also changed the power relations uh, financial situation of the municipalities so there's been a lot of, of debate on, on, on what to do with, the, uh, with this kind of, uh, of, of, of the structure. And of course, there will be a lot of challenges uh, regarding, for instance, the, the, uh, the changes of, of, of the personnel from municipal uh, um, employer to, to counties, which, is, which are going to be a totally new organizations in in in, uh, in 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 Finland, so also what is uh, um, remarkable is that it's this is really covering all uh, health and social services, all public health and social services, uh, more or less. So uh, all specialized care or primary care services. What is left to the municipalities is is, is part of the, uh, the health promotion and a part of the of of. Uh, environmental health, but all other uh, public uh, health and social services uh, uh, are moved to the, uh, the, um, to, to, uh, to the counties. Also, the reform is including the, the rescue services, which means fire departments, as well as pre-hospital emergency care, which will be uh, running Running by the by, by the counties, but uh, in a uh, as a separate division of the of, of the county organizations. So next slide. I'm not going to uh, tell about the history of the, of the reform. But it's very complicated, and uh, and uh, as I just said, there is still quite a lot of challenges uh, related to the, the, the what's going to happen on. On first uh, of January in, in uh, uh, 2023, but if we consider uh, the some of the drivers, this is this been making uh, uh, th this has been repaired for a long time, and and in fact, what has uh, what is the case is that that uh, these challenges we have had before the COVID has hasn't changed. So there is an aging population. There is a re regional disparities in a, in, a, in a in a large country like like Finland. And there is an inter internal migration different differences in the in the development, the economic development of, 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 of different regions, and and these are really the the, the strong drivers uh, behind the uh, uh, the reform. Of course, uh, uh, the uh, the Finnish health health and social care system and regional or, or local decision making has been really decentralized and uh, one of the, the ideas is of course to uh, to centralize this is to making imp improved and 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 make uh, make the, the central uh, stewardship more uh, 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 more strong and uh, trying to uh, to uh, uh, to get a better 
functioning coordination of, of decision making. A good example is that that uh, that uh, even if there is a, if a policy to strengthen uh, 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 primary health care in in, uh, in in Finland for a long time, the, the uh, quite a lot lots of uh, or uh, Emil, the audio quality is deteriorating. Okay, sorry. So it's good now. Good again. Okay, fine. So the uh, what has happened is that that the because of the of the local decision making uh, due to the fragmented structure of health and social services have been uh, uh, been uncoordinated. Yeah, the investment has been. Uh, um, there is an innovation, integrated care, boosting of the digitalization, uh, and 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 uh, uh, developing new care arrangements, which has been in the background as well. And of course, uh, um, even it's it's not very openly said said the uh, the cost containment is not the Ilmo, the audio is very bad. Okay, so I'm sorry, I cannot help <laughs> uh, at the moment. So it's uh, Finland is a very digitalized country already, but there is there is some uh, uh, room for improvement. But um, uh, I I finish here. Thank you so much, and I have to apologize for asking you to put a 15 years uh, reform history into uh, five uh, minutes. But I think it came very clearly across uh, how comprehensive these reforms are, and they that they touch upon almost every aspect and every corner of the health system, even though I think that the governance aspect is quite pertinent to the reforms because it's really about the balance between the national level and the local delivery. And you're trying to bring things together in, 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 the, in the middle, but of course there's also innovative um, delivery forms and new ways of uh, financing, which is part of it. Thank you so much, Ilmo. And um, I would like to go without further ado to ask our colleague um, Lucy to present on Czechia. Please, Lucy, the floor is all yours. So thank you for inviting me to this webinar. Um, I was asked to speak today a little bit more on uh, the Czech Republic and our health reform trends and uh, the ongoing reform agendas. Uh, um, with regard to what has been already said, um, I want to stress just a few particular issues because of course there's always lots of changes going on in the healthcare system. These might be small but important or they might be big and take quite a lot of time. So they may strength, uh, strength over uh, more than just one or two years. Um, going back to the Kate's uh, very nice presentation on the overall reform trends, I decided to pick up two uh, three, but two more that I want to talk more in detail of the reform trends of the Czech Republic that actually started and uh, were mainly finished before actually the pandemic uh, hit us. And they turned out to be a very uh, good basis for uh, what we've uh, been through uh, the past two years. The one relates to the digital health and transparency and more in particular to e-prescription and electronic uh, sick uh, leave. Um, the e-prescription has been there and is mandatory in the Czech Republic since 2018. And at the very beginning, of course, uh, it was uh, faced by uh, some popular opposition. 
uh, uh, but during the COVID era, it turned out that this is a very useful functionality that we have that actually people are not forced to go to see their uh, physician, but uh, the notes, the prescriptions are sent electronically. That So I want to uh, point on this example that actually um, some some changes that may look like a complication to some stakeholders uh, in the normal times may uh, prove to be good solutions in the non-normal times. Uh, the other trend, reform trend is the strengthening the role of the primary health care. And that's um, an ongoing initiative in the Czech healthcare system dating a few years back. Uh, where basically the competencies of general practitioners are strengthened. Uh, they take uh, they take care of uh, um, they take off some of the um, of uh, the workload from the specialists, more, more in particular of the diabetology patients and hypertension patients, but also recovered oncological patients. And for this purposes, there have been many tools uh, that had to be changed, uh, like um, uh, the selective prescriptions limitations were eased and the pay for performance for GPs was put in place. And this all was happening before the COVID, but of course the COVID turned out uh, to be an accelerator. Um, and um, we yet have to wait uh, to see the results of these initiatives, as uh, many of them were new in 2020. Uh, in 2020, also the electronic sick leave note was published, which, which again um, eased uh, um, the system and actually cancelled some of the necessary visits to the physician office in person that were uh, there necessary prior to this introduction. Still, uh, the Czech Republic is uh, not a um, perfectly digitalized country when we talk about healthcare, and we know that there are a lot of um, gaps in this, and there, uh, this is a long, um, uh, long uh, lasting, well recognized issue. But personally, I think that COVID actually helped uh, to uh, adopt a new e-health law in more quickly way because everyone recognized that there's this need for having uh, well-defined basic standards, uh, the infrastructure of the whole system, some safety measures, roles and responsibilities of all the stakeholders and actors of uh, the healthcare system. So we are happy to say that there's been a new law just recently passed a few weeks ago that def does define these standards and, uh, and uh, does uh, this basic, uh, um, uh, basic role for, uh, the, um, for the uh, digitaliz further digitalization of the Czech healthcare system and for the interconnectivity between the different uh, providers and stakeholders in the system. Uh, there have been uh, also other um, ongoing agendas uh, that uh, happened to be more pronounced uh, issues during uh, the COVID era, such as the mental health care reform that originally aimed at the, in, uh, the institutionalization um, and increasing the accessibility and quality of care. And this turned out that there is a lot of that we still have to do in the mental health care domain. Um, I think I will uh, stop over here and just uh, note that there's uh, uh, a lot of um, financing in the Czech healthcare system that's been put there over the past two years, additional financing that helped to ease the reform process and initiatives and also release uh, some sort of the losses uh, of, from the healthcare providers and health insurers. And there will be more to find on Czech healthcare reforms in the forthcoming Czech health system review of the observatory series, which is forthcoming in 2022. So uh, uh, I uh, 
advice to, to read it then <laughs> if you're more interested. So over to Matthias, thank you. Lucy, thank you so much for this fantastic and very concise overview on the ongoing reforms and the still pending reform agendas. And good to know, you know, that uh, the government has not forgotten about uh, the not the unfinished business. And also interesting to see here again that uh, probably COVID-19, as bad as it has been, has been probably an accelerator for some, not all, but some reforms in the area of digital and health. So thank you so much to the spotlight speakers. And I would like to ask now all the um, speakers to switch on their cameras and their audios. And Anna, can you fill us in what's coming through the uh, chat back box and feed it back to the panelists? Um, we've got a few um, questions, um, not that many, so please uh, do um, uh, send some more in. But at the moment, we've got two questions that um, I can, we can start off with. Um, one is uh, a more general question. Is there any concrete or unequivocal, unequivocal trends in centralization or decentralization of governance of the health systems that you've noticed? So this is a trends um, question um, due to, to COVID. Um, and I suppose attached to that, um, I would probably add in there, um, have countries some um, strategic priorities changed considerably um, or have some of the um, existing priority just been strengthened? Um, um, for example, you know, do you have national health strategy plans that have changed because of COVID? So that's one lot of questions that um, perhaps you can take a turn to, to answer. And then there was a second specific question to you, Lucy, and it's about the Czech Republic, and it was about e-prescriptions and what were the grounds um, for opposition to the implementation of um, e-prescriptions? So over to you. Thank you so much. Excellent questions. And I think we just uh, take it in turns and start with you. Kate, you don't need to answer to all of them, but just pick the ones out you feel you're best suited to respond to. Uh, thanks, Matthias. Thanks for the question. Um, I think I can say when looking at the dynamic of in governance reforms of this centralization and decentralization, um, of course, it somewhat depends on the administrative structure of a country, but it does look like since COVID's emergence that um, more countries, I would maybe err not to say unequivocally, this, but it seems that um, countries are looking at ways of central, centralizing governance, um, decision making um, at the higher level. Also, primary care seems to be um, caught up in this objective as well. And we don't see as many, we haven't seen any reforms in the last two years that are trying to strengthen or introduce more decentralization. Um, so I would say, whereas pre-COVID, you could still see the sort of dance between the, these tensions, um, or that there was a tension between these forces, that is no longer the case. Yeah, yeah, probably, you know, some of the governance reforms which were long pending were now possible actually for the first time. So there was political will and not too much resistance. And some of the governance reform were seen absolutely necessary, you know, where some centralization was taking place. In any case, there's a rebalancing between the national or federal level and the local and regional level going on. That's that's very, very clear. It would be interesting to know what sort of instruments also used to make this sure, make this clear in terms of transparency, accountability, and all this kind of stuff. Um, Ilmo, please. So about the centralization, the in, in Finnish case, the uh, this the COVID was wasn't really a driver for that. And and I, I think it was agreed by political parties that that this is the way to go because of course the starting situation is that the Finnish uh, system was and it still is ultra decentralized and and it's it's hard to reform make a reform in that uh, otherwise but but to go to the more centralized uh, um, uh, direction so the the point uh, if we consider the COVID uh, the the stakeholders uh, uh, I've, I've talked to, they agree that, that in a in cent, more centralized system, in the coming system, uh, the shocks like, like COVID pandemic is, is going to be easier to handle. 
because otherwise there are, uh, at the moment the, the, the ministry should talk to over 300 municipalities in order to to, to make this uh, coordination happen and and then they will have we have uh, will have only uh, uh, 20 plus uh, regions to 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 handle it oh, so that's the um, my answer you need I think it's a very important point, um, uh, Ilmo, because what you basically say is you need to improve your governance that you can ensure better health systems reforms in the in the future. In the current setup, it's too difficult, actually too complex and maybe too decentralized to have the, the health systems reforms you actually need. Lucy, please. I pick up the, the very specific question intended for me, and that's about what were the grounds for opposition to implementation of the e-prescription. Uh, generally speaking, it was a new system, uh, a new infrastructure. So of course there were some, um, some um, uneasy beginnings of this system, such as authorization of access for physicians. And the ground was actually uh, the, uh, the low level of, uh, the, uh, connect, of the connection of um, physicians and digitalization of patients' records within independent physician offices. So it did not really concern the hospitals or big providers of care, but rather the very many independent physician offices, not only the GPs, but also the specialists. And of course, uh, this is an important um, uh, stakeholder group. So once there's an opposition of these uh, physicians, there's a popular opposition as well, because people don't understand why they're physician actually is not happy with the new system and also many people tended to still uh, have uh, the e-prescription printed on paper and going to the pharmacy with the paper at the very beginning. What I think helped was the phasing in which was perhaps not the intention of the authors of the reform but it helped to actually get familiar with the system with uh, so many, uh, with the, all the population and that is that the viewing functionality that the physician could actually view the full uh, prescription record of a patient was faced in only two years after. So at the very beginning, this was uh, at, on one side an advantage because there was no safety worries of uh, everyone having uh, access to personal uh, uh, health records. But at the same time, it was an, uh, a disadvantage that the physicians themselves didn't see uh, this as an advantage because they could not see uh, the possible interactions of different prescriptions. It's there now, it's been there for the whole COVID and it's wonderful. So that's, that's fantastic no news. And the trick here is apparently incremental reform and that in the end the stakeholders themselves are demanding for better digital services if i understand you correctly anna do we have more questions i think we have enough time for another quick round and there's not a specific question here but i just have some follow-on uh, questions uh, lucy you, what you're talking about is sort of barriers to implementation and these are always very important in uh, reform agendas and um often financing is seen as a barrier to to um implementing reforms and so there's a question um that we could ask um you know we know that most governments have poured lots of extra funding into the health system as part of the the covid response um in your countries there have there been any financing reforms um specific Specifically, that have um, uh, either to do with COVID or that they were um, because of COVID now there's a uh, they've inspired a relook at sort of payment systems or other financing mechanisms. Um, would you like to start perhaps um, uh, you Lucy and then Ilma? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Anna. Um, yes, I mentioned it already during my presentation that there, there are actually two things. One thing is that the Czech healthcare system did get extra money during the COVID time. And this extra money came from the state budget. And uh, the, uh, the increase in state payment on behalf of the economically uh, inactive population is meant as a permanent one. So the system, the, the statutory health 
insurance system can count with this increase for the next years. Of course, uh, the question is whether it is uh, fiscally um, uh, fiscally reasonable in terms of the public financing, but for the health system, it's definitely a good news. Uh, this actually meant that the in, uh, that the insurance system did not suffer any kind of um, significant shortages of cash flow. And that means that the providers were um, compensated for their losses and extra work due to COVID in a rather general manner. Uh, I may uh, note in this context, uh, the recent article of Ruth, uh, of Ruth Weitzberg on the financing uh, during the COVID, uh, the, uh, the adjustment in financial payments in European and other countries during the pandemic. And uh, that's it, I think. Please. So, um, in Finland, because the, the funding uh, is uh, is at the moment based on the the, the municipality municipalities, the uh, the extra money uh, and funding went to the the, the municipalities uh, mainly, and they they are also the extra cost. Uh, there is some small uh, appropriation uh, which were were paid and and uh, and channel to the, the hospital districts, for instance, uh, purchasing uh, laboratory tests and things like that. But but in, in, in the case of the need for any, any, any kind of rewards in, uh, in, in, in funding system. Ilmo, thank you so much. The last two words were not so well understood. Can you repeat the last sentence just? So there was no need for funding funding reforms in the, in the Finnish case. That's okay, thank you so much. Kate, it's time to wrap up you, your key messages from today's webinars and from this uh, monitoring of trends, please. Uh, sure, I would say that, um, in fact, and, and what Lucy and Elmo have also touched upon is that the while the, while the pendulum of health policy uh, or health system reforms seems to be going towards expansion of, of scope of coverage, breadth and depth, um, addressing inequities, uh, also looking at integration of social care and expanding multidisciplinary care, especially in primary care. Um, that these actually were uh, on the reform agenda before, and um, and COVID did provide a catalyst or a, a very good reason to consolidate these efforts. Um, and so, so yes, there's unfinished business, but it seems to be getting done now. Um, so I would say it's let's see where the pendulum, if it's a sustained pendulum swing. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. And uh, let's hope that the pendulum gets stuck and it's not swinging back uh, and that uh, we have uh, further progress in health systems reforms as you just have described. Thank you so much to all the speakers and to the audience. Thank you for tuning in. And next week we will talk about uh, mental health and COVID-19. So bye-bye. Take care. Mm -hmm.